Over 100 years ago, Boar's Head opened its doors with a different set of rules. No cutting corners, no compromises. Exceptional Boar's Head products began to appear. Our deluxe ham, oven gold turkey, and ever roast chicken. Made to standards rarely found in the deli business today. Of course, Boar's Head isn't sold everywhere. Only in stores that share our high standards and slice our products fresh at the deli. Boar's Head. Compromise elsewhere. Love Talk Radio. Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is William Bell. I want to welcome you to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio. And uh, to also uh, welcome to the broadcast this evening, uh, Daniel Rogers. Daniel, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, William. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, thank you for Good. having me on. And uh, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. We're always delighted to have you here. Um, Don Preston, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, taking care of his lovely wife Jan, uh, as you know from listening to past broadcasts and you know checking Facebook and other uh, media where he's uh, expressed himself that she's been uh, ill and is undergoing you know treatments for her condition, uh, doing uh, quite well at this point in recovery, and so we're grateful for that. But nevertheless, they have some ongoing. Uh, business to take care of regarding her health, and so he's uh, making sure that he's by her side at every step of the way, and you certainly have to commend him for uh, taking care of his of his lovely wife, and uh, we do miss him, but at the same time, we're delighted to have Daniel with us from Labor Night Not in Vain, and uh, I believe he has a program on this broadcast of Face to Face, and we're grateful uh, for that, but um Daniel and I have worked together in the past. We've had a lot of fun uh, in doing so, and um, we're here tonight to continue the review of um, the Parable of the Virgins by uh, Mike Benson that was done on the Power 2017 uh, lectures. Um, Daniel, I know that you've been a little busy with uh, maybe school and some other things. Uh, everything okay your way? Man, things are going great. Um, we We actually started back. A preaching school last night with First Peter and Hebrews, and even bigger news, uh, I just took and passed my life insurance license exam. And so uh, hopefully, if everything goes well, starting this Saturday, I'm going to begin work with a, as a representative, representative of a new company selling life insurance. And so we hope that that's going to go as planned. <laughs> Well, that's that's very good. You know, I I um, used to be a life insurance agent myself, and um, you know, I guess uh, that was some years ago. But I never thought about how um, important that was until one of my clients, whose home I'd gone to one, you know, one uh, I guess it was somewhere around August of that year. And they had a uh, relatively small insurance policy uh, and didn't think they could get any more coverage. But we were there uh, doing some um, replacements and upgrading and got them into a much larger policy that uh, was way over six figures uh, at the time. And this was, wow, this was 30 years ago. (laughs) 
And uh, so to take them from, you know, just a, um, you know, 10 or 20, uh, maybe 20,000 from that. And then um, somewhere along the line, the wife died. And um, that's when what you do as an insurance agent really kind of settles in and lets you know the reality of how important that is when you know that you've gone in and helped a family financially that otherwise might have, you know, had some difficult times. And uh, several of those clients, you know, came back to me years later and just really thanked me for the job that was done. So I, I hope that you have many of those experience, not necessarily for people to, to experience that, but that the people that you do take care of, they're well taken care of, and they will uh, appreciate you for helping them with, you know, such an important um, financial aspect in their lives, especially for young ones. Cause I've also experienced uh, the situations where single moms, you know, didn't have any coverage They're, they're or at least they were married and their husbands passed away and they didn't have any coverage and what a devastating uh, condition it left the family. So it's very important and um, hope you do extremely well uh, in your career. I really appreciate that, William. And uh, from, from what I've heard from the people that I've talked to and involved in this business and with this particular company, uh, my background as a minister and as a preacher um, is apparently going to fit very well in with how their company likes to do things. And so I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to uh, not only just to help support my family, but also to serve uh, other people. And maybe even there will be opportunities for my ministry through me going into these people's homes and, and helping them prepare for the future. So maybe I can offer two types of uh, life insurance, William. <laughs> yeah, uh, blessed assurance and life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So very good. Well, you know, uh, you attended the Power Lectures with me back uh, about a month or so ago, and um, if it's been that long, I don't know, time kind of zips by so quickly. I guess it was because it was right after the uh, Predators Pilgrim weekend for 2017, so it was that, that following uh, week. And uh, we listened to some lectures that were supposed to have been on the end of time, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. Um, we didn't broadcast last week because uh, Don had problems with his computer. I had problems with mine. And by the time I got it worked out, we were like 30 minutes past. And so, uh, and I don't think Don ever got his worked out that evening. So that's why we weren't on. But, you know, we're back here tonight and we're going to cover um, with Daniel uh, some of the things that uh, we had planned that night. But at any rate, we're going to be talking about the. Um, Parable of the Virgins, which was a presentation done by Mike Benson at the Power 2017 Lectures in South Haven, Mississippi. And um, this is a very, very uh, great theme to talk about as far as the wedding theme. And of course, if you've listened to the first two lessons, you know that uh, Don did some very excellent work in developing the wedding theme from uh, Hosea and from uh, Isaiah and uh, other passages in the Old Testament. We're going to focus uh, on Matthew and just talk about some of the things uh, there, but also on some of the other passages in the New Testament related to the uh, to the wedding theme. So, um, I guess first, uh, Daniel, we'll start off, you know, in looking at the um, the parable. Um, of Matthew 25, and, um, you know, in some points that were made by uh, Mike Benson in his presentation, as we had mentioned before, uh, he pointed out some things where, you know, he talked about, in our day, weddings are generally focused on the bride, whereas at that time, they were focused on the bridegroom, and that certainly evident when you look at the parable because it seems like all the attention was primarily focused on uh, the coming of the bridegroom even though uh, the um, ten virgins were you know a great part of that story and um, so to look at it from that perspective and to see just how things have changed from that time until now is very very uh, important Another aspect of the um, wedding is the fact that you have 
the betrothal state. And sometimes people are not really aware of that in terms of the New Testament and how um, that process is laid out. So it's kind of good to look at what happened between Mary and Joseph. I think that tells a very um, or presents a very good analogy for us to look at the betrothal period in the New Testament regarding uh, the marriage, because some, you know, would claim that the wedding has already occurred while at the same time believing that the coming of the Lord is still future. So initially, uh, would you have any comments just on that paradigm or on that perspective that we have a marriage that is considered already completed and yet um, have um, the coming of the Lord as future. And sometimes we get charged with, um, you know, with children out of wedlock, so to speak. So do you think that is a fair assessment for us when we're talking about, you know, the concept of wedding in the uh, in the New Testament. Well, the reason why we make those uh, mistakes is because of how we view marriage. Uh, we, you know, we don't view being engaged as a legally binding thing, but as you've kind of directed our minds, William, uh, Matthew one eighteen and nineteen show that the betrothal was a, was a legally uh, binding agreement and. That's something that um, uh, Brother Benson did a good job of pointing out in his speech. Uh, but if you think about the charge that we have children being born out of wedlock, um, it's really easily explained by Matthew 1, 18 and 19. How was Jesus found with a child? I mean, how was Mary found with a child? She mm-hmm. was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. And so if you think about the work of the Holy Spirit in the first century, the children of God that were produced were produced how? They were produced uh, by the Holy Spirit within that betrothal uh, period. And so that's not uh, – that's, that's causing the saints of the first century to be just as illegitimate as Jesus was, which, of course, uh, uh, he was not. So. Okay. All right. Very good. And uh, we do have – I'm sorry. Were you going to say something uh, else? Yeah, we have a caller. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in and see what's going on with that. I'll, I'll be back. Okay. All right. Um, So we have a situation or um, example in the New Testament, as Daniel alluded to, from Matthew chapter 1, where it talks about Joseph and Mary before they came together. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the reason... For that was because she, of course, uh, had been impregnated by the Holy Spirit before the two of them came together to consummate the marriage. Now, in the time of the New Testament, for a young unmarried couple, the betrothal, which was a legal, as Daniel said, a legal binding contract, would last for about a year. And if they were older, the time was shorter. But for the younger couple, it was uh, a time of approximately a year. And, um, and so within that time, they had not come together. And uh, as Daniel said, she had child of the Holy Spirit. Now, you have a similar situation with the church in the New Testament, that the period between the time of Pentecost, if you please, and the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the time of the end, we understand to be the coming of Christ, was considered as the betrothal. And during that time, the Holy Spirit was there. Uh, And Paul alludes to the uh, betrothal in the um, Second Corinthians, in the uh, eleventh chapter of Second Corinthians, where he says, "I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband 
or betrothed you to one husband, the spousal and betrothal are basically the same thing, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, oftentimes when we're discussing uh, the law, particularly a text like Romans 7, we have those who want to say that Christ and the church were already married. Now, they were in a legal binding contract in terms of uh, what was about to take place. There was the betrothal, but the marriage had not actually been consummated. So everything in the New Testament was looking forward to that time. That's why Paul says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. As we were saying, you have this time of the betrothal and the fact that the marriage was to come at a time later, the same as it was with Joseph and Mary, because he had not consummated uh, the marriage. So when you look at um, the wedding, throughout the New Testament, you have several passages, and I'll just mention some of them. Uh, Romans 7, 4 is one of them, where... As I mentioned earlier, it is suggested, or you know, we, it is argued, I should say, that Romans 7, 4 indicates the consummated marriage, and it does not. What it actually uh, talks about, and there's someone else on the line, um, Daniel. Um, I'll I was going to let him sit. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I'll, I'll take it in a moment, and um, I'll see what's up. But at any rate... Um, in Romans 7 and verse, so call if you're on the line, you just hang on for a moment. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to have your question ready uh, because I'll take it uh, based on what we've had so far. We're going to take it off the air and then I will repeat your question if it is proper. All right. And so in verse 4 of Romans, he says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another so that expresses a future you know it's uh, subjunctive that you may be married the wedding had not taken place there was a betrothal in in place but sometimes you know we read over these things and we don't see the future that's involved in them and we don't take the entire context uh in place and that's what matthew 25 is about it's about the wedding that is at the end, uh, or the time of the end, as opposed to being uh, at any time prior to. So it wasn't a case where they were, quote, married. They were entering into that betrothal state of which the Bible spoke. And the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, another text on the marriage uh, that says that Christ would present um, that the bride would be presented to him, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it would be holy and without blemish. And so there's another text that states that the wedding was yet future. And so um, why don't you, while I screen the caller, um, talk a little bit about the wedding from the perspective of Revelation 19, and uh, just kind of continue that thought, and then when I come back, we'll we'll uh, talk a little bit about um, what's going on in Matthew 25 uh, relative to the time of the wedding and um, the saints, you know, meeting uh, the Lord from that perspective. All right, thank you, William. And uh, sure. so, as as William was saying, the wedding of Christ is tied into the presentation of the church to Him, and this will take place. At the coming of the Lord. In Revelation 19, we also have it stated uh, that the wedding would take place at the fall of this city called Babylon. And so we're going to start in Revelation 19 and begin in verse 1 and read. He says, After these things, I heard a loud voice of the great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteousness are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, he's avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. That's a very important aspect to what we're about to read. And so 
this is the avenging of the saints. And then he says this in verse uh, in verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. What was the indication that the wedding had come? It was the, the fall of this city that's called the harlot, the city that had uh, persecuted the servants and had spilt their blood. When that city is destroyed, then you have the presentation of the bride and the, the marriage of the Lamb. But notice that there's a uh, there's the idea here of the wife being made ready. Well, what is this? Notice what he says. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. This is how she was arrayed. This is how she was made ready. Clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. She was made ready within the first century. She was made ready through the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit revealed the good things to come. And the Holy Spirit was assisting the preparation of the church. And in this way, she was made ready. In this way, uh, the saints would be able to attain to uh, the righteousness of Jesus and, and be prepared through the washing of water and the word, as we read in Ephesians chapter 5. And in that way, uh, the bride had made herself ready by the time of the fall of this city that had persecuted the saints. And so notice what takes place next. In verse 9 of chapter 19, he said, he said to me, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So this scripture here, verse 9 that is, it ties in uh, the, the marriage supper to the marriage, which makes sense, right? And even though that makes a lot of sense, a lot of people have the marriage and the marriage supper separated by many years. And so... We have some of our brethren who teach that the marriage took place at the cross or maybe Pentecost, and they don't have the marriage supper taking place until, uh, well, some in the future and some at 87. It depends on William going back to that old roundabout that we wrote on a couple weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that all of this is posited at the fall of Babylon, at the destruction of a harlot, the, the city who persecuted the saints. And I'm sure that we're going to, and we could spend much, much time on uh, this theme of the wedding supper in connection to the wedding. And that, that'll help us give a, uh, have a lot of understanding about Matthew 22 or about Matthew 25 and similar passages to that. Um, All right. Well, is, Daniel, is that, we do have that, a legitimate caller on the line. Okay, good. <laughs> That's what I was about to ask. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, we have David Gates on. Let me go ahead and, and open up his mic. There was a little background noise there, so I, I just um, kind of closed his mic off. But he has a question. It's it's uh, related to marriage and the end time, but it's probably one that people you know ask a lot. So um, we'll go ahead and get him on. Um, all right, David, you're live on the air, and welcome to uh, Two Guys in the Bible right here on Fulfill Radio. And I'm um, glad to have you on. Okay, it's nice to be here. I'm in my sound my sound room now, so there may be a little less background noise. Okay. Uh, I heard y'all just yeah I heard y'all just had an interesting caller. That was before I called in. Right. Uh, yeah. I can't wait to <laughs> edit that out of here. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, David, think, before before yeah. you give your uh, before you give your question, don't you have a interesting phone interview coming up this weekend? Can you tell us about that? Oh, uh, Dr. Don Preston. Um, yeah, uh, this weekend, on uh, Saturday, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, Dr. Don K. Preston has agreed to uh, come on the air. And um, uh, I'm going to pretty much turn it over to him to let him discuss it and address things that he feels is relevant to uh, covenant eschatology. But uh, we're also going to be taking callers live, and uh, if anyone has any questions, um, then they can email them. Uh, I'm not as well versed on this email address as Billy, but I believe it's uh, Good News Media Productions uh, at Gmail dot com, if I'm not mistaken. Um, or, but if that doesn't work, then you can also send them to me at David D is in David. <laughs> DavidDGates882 at gmail.com 
Uh, I'd be happy to read any of those on the air to Dr. Don uh, K. Preston. And uh, with that being said, I hope to join you there. Um, I've been studying this um, inside out. I've just finished the uh, the Preston and Hester debate. Um, not going to voice my thoughts on that <laughs> just yet, but uh, I was looking for a better debate uh, supporting their position, actually, and that's about as much as I'm going to say about that for now. Um, but uh, I had a question about the marriage thing. Um, I've had I've heard it uh, recently debated uh, from actually uh, both sides. I'm listening to the Holger Neubauer and uh, Howard Denham debate as we speak. I, I paused it to call in, and they were discussing this marriage. And I also heard Steve uh, Bazin and in the. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Drew I'm Leonard. horrible with names. Drew, Drew Leonard. Drew Leonard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and um, and and in in uh, Steve. In his argument, he was uh, addressing that uh, something about the marriage of Matthew 22, and he was saying, you know, they had came and brought uh, this question to Jesus that this this man had uh, so many uh, brothers. He had a wife. He died. Jewish custom says that the brother had to raise up seed. So we're talking about a, a sort of a physical marriage here, but the way I'm hearing them use this in this debate. It's pertaining to the resurrection, and uh, I, I think that I hadn't got to, I hadn't got the best understanding out of this. I'm not sure the exact question that I want to ask about it, but it seemed to me that Jesus is actually being questioned about a physical marriage and the resurrection. Could somebody just shine some light on this for me? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll start off um, first. We should approach the subject matter in the same way that uh, we approach John chapter 3 with the new birth. And if Jesus is having a conversation there with his disciples, or with Nicodemus, excuse me, and um, about being born again, and Nicodemus' mind goes back to a scenario that was the manner in which he became an Israelite under the law, which was by his natural birth. So he asked when Jesus said, you know, that a man had to be born again, he said, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into this, uh, his mother's womb a second time and be born? Now, that is the way he became associated with the old covenant it was through natural birth of course marriage was required for that according to the law of god it was through uh, his natural birth but that is what was true under the law under the age of moses the new birth of water and of the spirit is that which would be accomplished through or and in um the new covenant it did not preclude physical birth. In other words, men and women would still be producing children in the new covenant. However, the sons of the new covenant, those who are born of water and of the spirit, are not the result of a physical union. They don't come through natural procreation. Now, that's really the same scenario that you have in Matthew, I mean, yeah, Matthew 22 and Luke chapter 20. Now, it's spelled out a little bit more um, distinctively there because they bring up this scenario, but that's really the essence of what's going on. And if you can understand John chapter 3, the distinction between natural birth and spiritual birth, you should be able to understand the distinction between the um, levered marriage law and natural inheritance versus spiritual inheritance because that's what the subject really is. So let's kind of go in now and discuss it in a little bit more detail. When they come to Christ, and I'm, I'm using um, Luke's account because of some details that Luke has that Matthew doesn't, 
But in Luke's in Luke account, where? when they uh, uh, chapter twenty, and okay. uh, starting in in verse twenty seven. Okay. So it says, then some of the Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to him and asked him, saying, "Teacher, now it's very important to note the source text that they use to build their hypothetical case upon. This is ignored when brethren come to us and make the objection that they make. They base it on something separate and apart from what the Sadducees base their question on. So the Sadducees came to him saying, teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man di- br- man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take up his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, what's the source of that teaching? The source of that teaching is the law of Moses. So we're talking not about something that belongs in the Christian age to start with. We're talking about something that was true of the age of Moses, just like the way to get into the kingdom of Israel, the old covenant kingdom of Israel, was through natural birth, as we mentioned in John 3. This example was about a marriage situation that also was governed by the law of Moses. So he said, Moses wrote to us saying that if a man's brother dies. Now, I don't think there's anyone who uses that argument as a Christian would argue that they are at this point in time under the law of Moses. As a matter of fact, they will argue you till they they turn blue or black in the face that they are not under the law of Moses, yet they pull an example and try to build an argument that was based upon the law of Moses. So they are quoting directly from Deuteronomy, and you can't get too much more law than that. Uh, (laughs) They are quoting directly from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 8 in particular. Now, so the law said, if a man's brother dies having a wife, this is not a blanket statement for all marriages. It wasn't it didn't even cover all marriages in Israel. It covered the marriages that met the condition of which he speaks. And that is a man who dies and he has no male child. Now that was important. It was important because the inheritance of Israel, the physical land was passed down through the male, through the son, from the father to the son. So this is a parable, uh, not a parable, but this is a, uh, an example or teaching that is actually related to the inheritance. And uh, because they associated and understood resurrection was a part of the Messianic age, a part, and that related to the inheritance. Anyone who studies the end time should realize that resurrection and inheritance go hand in hand. Let me just give you a quick verse. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 21. Um, If there could have been a law which could have given life, there's life, life from the dead, verily righteousness would have been by the law. But the point is, uh, he doesn't say the body coming out of the ground would have been by the law. He says righteousness. So resurrection, life is righteousness. That's another error that they make when they uh, address this situation. So in a case where the brother has died and he left no offspring, his brother, an eligible brother or next of kin, because in the case of Ruth and Boaz, um, when Ruth's husband died, was it Ruth or Naomi? Um, Naomi, when her husband died, Uh, it was the next of kin. I guess I'm getting that correct. I might have it backwards. But it was the next of kin. If if the brother would not perform that, then they went to the next of kin. But it's the same idea. This is what's called the Leverett Law of Marriage, okay? A very specific law for a very specific situation. This is what they tried to trap Jesus with 
concerning the resurrection. So they uh, bring up the hypothetical case, and they say, um, here's a man who died, didn't have a child, and now Moses said his brother had to marry the surviving widow and raise up a son to the deceased brother. And there was a reason for that. He, he didn't just go in and marry her and then they have children and that child become his heir. No, the child was to become the heir of the deceased brother. That was very, very important. And um, so in this scenario, there were seven brothers. Each one died without having a child. And so they all had married the woman. So their scenario was, in the resurrection, whose wife would she be of the seven who had her? Okay? So Jesus told them, you err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. First of all, they didn't understand the distinction between being under the law and being under the gospel. Secondly, the inheritance of the gospel is different from the inheritance under the law. And then thirdly, being in the gospel does not require physical marriages to produce children in order to pass down the inheritance. You can inherit the kingdom whether you are married or single, whether you are male or female. There were three people under the law who did not have the legal right to an inheritance. One was a slave, two was a woman, and three Holy was right. a gentile. Now, Paul deals with all of that. Galatians chapter 3 is really the answer to this um, alleged or, or uh, contradiction or problem that they uh, believe exists here. But Galatians 3 is primarily focused on the inheritance. If you study the chapter carefully, you will see that it's talking about the inheritance. And that's what it concludes on in verse 29, the inheritance. But let's just take verses 26 through 29 for a moment. And, and even as I mentioned verse 21 earlier, verse 18, all of those are passages related to the inheritance and what God had promised Abraham. But he said in verse 26, for you are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now the one that he was talking about was the seed and he had made the statement that in the seed, all families of the earth would be blessed. All families would receive the inheritance. That's what that means. And so as he concludes in verse 29, he says, and if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He's just told you it doesn't matter whether you are a slave or free. It doesn't matter whether you are male or female. It doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Greek. Everyone has the right to the inheritance. So what Jesus was saying to them in um, Luke chapter 20 was that in the resurrection, that is, in the age to come, number one, he's not precluding marriage in the age to come because the age to come is the age that follows the Jewish age. So that is the present Christian age, whereas these brethren have the age to come as yet future to the Christian age. So they got an age between the age, number one, and that doesn't work. But he says, in this age, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. That's not a statement saying there would be no marriages, per se, in the kingdom of God in terms of uh, relationships like perhaps you have and like I have and like Daniel has. He's saying we don't need physical procreation, we don't need physical marriages in order to produce sons of God. Because as Daniel started out in this broadcast, the sons of God were produced through the Spirit and through obedience to Christ 
through faith. That's Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29 that we've just uh, mentioned. So through faith and obedience is how sons of God are produced. And therefore, marriage is not required for that. We don't have a levered marriage law for the new covenant age. That's the distinction between the two. Now, the, um, the whole purpose of that was that they would be able to perpetuate the inheritance of the land because it was against the law for them to change the landmarks. And if they didn't have a son, then if they married outside of their tribe, that inheritance would pass down to a different tribe and therefore end up altering the borders of the land of Israel, which was forbidden under the law. And if a man refused to do that, if he was eligible, it was like an insult and a shame because it was something about um, um, he would, they would spit in his face, they would go before the elders, relate that, and if it was confirmed that he wouldn't do it, they would spit in his face, and then um, it was something about the sandal of his shoe removed. Well, that had to do with, with the shame that was associated with refusing to obey that law. So that was a levered marriage law. You can even see it in, in Genesis, I think it's 39, with Onan, uh, who refused to raise up uh, a seed and spilt it, you know, his seed on the ground. But that was the same idea, but it was a part of the levered marriage law. It is not a part of Christianity for us to do that. Uh, how many people would, um, you know, if the spouse died, um, the brother required to marry her and to raise up a child and then you raise up the child to the deceased father so that the inheritance can go to them that's not our inheritance we have a spiritual inheritance and it is not about uh, physical marriage going on so when when the lord said in verse uh, 34 that the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage he's referring specifically to the jewish age but those who accounted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. And that, is a, that phrase, nor can they die anymore, is Jesus' statement in John eight fifty one, where he says, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. So what you have here is basically an ellipsis of that statement. And also John eleven twenty five and uh, 26 he who believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and those who live and believe on me will never die. So th this is a conditional statement that's being made, even though he doesn't state the condition here. The condition is found elsewhere in the gospel, and that is that a person has to keep the word of Christ, and that's how we do not die. Um, and then he says, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now Christ said, I am the resurrection. So if we are sons of Christ, we are therefore sons of the resurrection. Now, how many people had to be physically married in order to become a Christian, in order to become a son of God? None. That is what the Lord is talking about when he says they neither marry nor are given in marriage the age to come. Physical marriage is not required for us to be sons of God. I so another, hope that that's yeah. Daniel, add anything you want to. Well, I was going to say something, uh, if you don't mind. Go for sure. it, David. Um, so, in other words, you think that that passage could have been translated better in a way to give us a, a more clarity? Or is there is it just something you had to read that deep into, or do you feel that it should have just been reworded to where people could understand it easier? Well, well the, the con are you talking about the, the word world, do you think? Um, no, I'm talking about uh, neither marry nor are given in marriage, and are but they are like angels. Because I'm going to say, like you know, I'm 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 still uh, I'm still in a position where I don't say, hey, I adhere to this. Uh, I, how can I say I adhere to something if I don't understand the entirety of it? And if I don't uh, agree or understand the entirety of something, why in the world would I say I adhere or disagree with it? So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I'm trying to comprehend your position on everything more than uh, agree or disagree uh, so much in some instances. And so I get to this part right here, and um, from a futurist standpoint, 
it does seem to if unless it's a bad translation it would seem to look more uh in their favor that they were it was talking about or now i don't want to necessarily say in their favor but i would say it sounds more like it's talking about afterlife because of the wording is i guess what i'm asking can i can i ask you a question david sure 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 sure. yeah yeah all right so are you uh would you would you consider yourself to be male or female male all right now aren't you in christ absolutely We'll see three Galatians three twenty eight says that there is no male female in Christ. So see there's no marriage or given in marriage in the new covenant. You don't have to be married to your wife to produce a child to be able to say that you have a child of God. You can go out and teach somebody about Jesus and if they respond positively to the gospel and they they obey the gospel, they're gonna become a child of God, you see. So I guess, so I guess the I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I was going to say it's the same thing. It's, it's kind of what William was trying to say uh, and what he did say and uh, is that in the new covenant, there is no marriage and given in marriage, and there can't be because in the new covenant, there's neither male or female, you see. But that, that doesn't preclude that – doesn't, that doesn't mean that there isn't you know, marriage or given in marriage, but that's not done in the new covenant. That's, that's not part of the new covenant, you see. Oh, part of the new covenant. I got you. I got you. Well, I mean, uh, I noticed that marriage, divorce, and remarriage is not your uh, – people try to like what he was saying, and I just spoke on this on point by point Saturday, as a matter of fact, and I was even put in question about it. And I, I pointed out how in Matthew 19 uh, they were asking questions pertaining to their law, as he uh, just said, and um, that <laughs> – the law is t- it's over. It's obliterated. It does not apply to me. They asked me about Romans 7. My answer to that was he said plain as day right there that he was speaking to people that knew the law. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm seeing what you're seeing right there about, uh, you know, so in other words, uh, it's not so much. Uh, right, right, right. I, I think I see a little bit more of what you're saying now. Yeah, no, that's not to say that there isn't. Uh, that there isn't restrictions in the New Testament, for example, in First Corinthians, that talk about how we ought to live in terms of our husbands and our wives. But in terms of receiving inheritance, in terms of being a child of God, marriage and given in marriage, being male or female, being bond or Greek, uh, having a child doesn't have anything to do with your stance in God's eyes. And that's, but it did, it did change it in the Old Testament. Um, so, in other words, they were addressing the question based on their standpoint of inheritance, and he addressed it, rebuking their idea of inheritance. Yeah, in fact, he told them, "You do." He said, "You don't. Uh, you don't even understand the scriptures." Um, right. Listen. So, listen. Yeah, listen let, to this passage uh, from from Ruth. I, William, I'm just going to read this this passage real quick, and I'll let you take over back again. So, oh, about yeah, that. go ahead. Uh, so, Sorry. whenever Boaz fulfills his uh, duty as, as the close kin to marry Ruth and to perpetuate the inheritance. Notice what the people say to Naomi. They say this in Ruth 4, 14 and 15. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. May his name be famous in Israel, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you who is better to you than seven sons has born him. So now here's the picture. In order for Naomi to have restored life, in order for her and Harris to be perpetuated, this relationship had to take place. But see, that's not true in the new covenant. In order to have your life restored, it doesn't matter who your next of kin is. It matters whether or not you're a child of God. And that's, that's the point Jesus is making. So uh, William, right. what were you going to say? Yeah, and, and that's a good point. Um, actually, that same point is made in um, Deuteronomy 25, so let me just expand on that just a little bit uh, as well uh, in the verses that they quote. Because in verse, uh, let's see, yeah, verse 6, it says, And it shall be that the firstborn son, which she bears, will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Now, one of the things that I think we've been 
a little remiss in understanding about physical birth or the birth of children in the Old Covenant is that that is the way they viewed immortalizing themselves as far as physical Mm -hmm. life was concerned. It wasn't through them living forever physically. It was through their posterity. That's why it was considered such a blessing in Israel to have children. If you didn't have any children, that was considered like a curse on you. It was also considered as death, and that's what Daniel was indicating when he said that um, he would be a restorer of life. So that's how they viewed life or their um, name continuing throughout Israel. That was, in a sense, their, quote, physical immortality, if you please, and that was through their descendants. If they didn't have any, any descendants, then it was like they were being cut off. And you can see that over and over again in the scriptures. I was looking for, um, and I thought it was Numbers 34, the, the, the daughters of Zelophehad. had. Where's that text, Daniel? Do you remember? Uh, uh, hang on just a second. I'll, I'll find it for Is you. it Deuteronomy uh, or is it Numbers? Um, um, it, it it's going to be in, let's see, Numbers 27. Numbers 27. Okay, I thought it was uh, Numbers 34, but Numbers 27. Let's take a look there. While, um, while you're flipping over there, William, um, that's that's one of the things that people miss about about what the Sadducees asked in Jesus' response. When he says, they'll never die, they'll be equal to the angels, they'll be called the sons of God. See, we, we want to jump and say that has to do with spiritual life. While that's true in part, it doesn't get the whole picture. What it has to do with is their name. Their name's not going to be cut off. And I'll, I'll add something to that once William brings out his, uh, his point here. So. Okay, now there was an exception made. When a man had no uh, sons, he had only uh, daughters. And um, so Moses made an exception in a case like that. And I'll, I'll read this. this. This might be a little lengthy reading, but I want you to see how many times the word inheritance is mentioned in the chapter. So it says, then came the daughters, this is starting at verse 1, of Zelophehad, the sons of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Macher, the son of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these were the names of his daughters, Mala, uh, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza. I know I'm butchering those names. And they stood before <laughs> Moses, the, uh, before Eliezer, the priest, and before the leaders of, and all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. But he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord in the company with Korah, but he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. So here's one of those situations. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family? Because he had no son. Give us a possession among our father's brothers. See, they didn't have a possession. They wouldn't have had an inheritance in the land. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. If he has no daughter... Then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the relative closest to him in his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statute of judgment, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So you can see throughout all of those uh, examples that it was always about the inheritance being passed on, that was connected to the name, that was connected to the descendant that was to be born. And you do not have to worry about that in the kingdom of God because your name never ceases. It's an everlasting name. All right, uh, Daniel, you said you had something you wanted to add on that. Uh, right. So uh, each of the qualities listed in Luke 20 and in Matthew 22, he says, they'll never die. They'll be like the angels. And they'll be the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Okay, well, first of all, if you think about this, are you a son of God? 
Yes. Are you ever going to die? Well, physically, one day you'll die. But Jesus says concerning man's spiritual state, such as in John 11, 25 and 26, if you live and believe in me, you'll never die. And so you already have something that applies to you. Are you of the resurrection? Well, that's what Romans 6 says. And, and Romans 6, by the way, if you take out the italicized words there, uh, Paul says this in verse 5. If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be of resurrection. So if you're in Christ, you're of resurrection. Well, we like to say that those three qualities, you'll never die, you're like the angels, you're the sons of God, has to do with their spiritual life. And while that's true, it doesn't capture the full picture. What it's specifically dealing with in that context is their name. L listen to what this says in Isaiah, um, in Isaiah chapter 50. Six, I believe we are. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 56, the Bible says this, and we're going to begin in verse 3. Do not let the sons of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utter, utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place. So there's that possession that William talked about in Numbers 27. He says he's going to give them a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And this is looking forward to, if you look at the context, uh, this is looking forward to the time of Christ. And so what's being said here is they're going to get a name better than sons and daughters. Well, how is that? Because it's not dependent upon physical marriage and given in marriage. It depends upon faith. And no wonder uh, the eunuch went on his way rejoicing because he realized he had a name that wouldn't be cut off. He, his name would never die out of the land. He was like the angels in that sense. And we see that he would be a son of God. That's whose name he would then from forevermore wear. So that's just another point there for you, David. Okay, and um, right here, back to the top where they were asking him the question, I think this is what throws the biggest tech in it for me because right. it's actually addressing people that take a wife and then die, and then he addresses the resurrection. I guess that's why that was the biggest uh, question of all to me is, is how uh, they were relating that um, to an entirely different age and actually still being physically alive because it looks like right here they're addressing people that physically died and then referring to a resurrection. Yeah, well, if you think about it, they are sort of assuming here that the resurrection is going to – for life to continue here on this earth in some way. You know, They have a misconception uh, about the whole thing from point A to, to point Z. So uh, I know we're out of time. William, do you have anything? Uh, no, way. that pretty much uh, sums it up. I want to thank David for, um, you know, asking the question and um, bringing it to the fore so that we could discuss it as we have. I hope that you were able to get a little bit more clarity than, you know, what you've had in the past. Sometimes it takes, you know, more than one time to visit these passages to really grasp what's being said. But um, I... Um, just certainly appreciate, you know, your being here today and uh, hope that, uh, you know, we were able to help out in, in just a small way. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me. Yeah. And don't forget uh, this Saturday, if you go to good news media productions on block talk radio, you'll be able to listen to uh, Dr. Don Preston on David's radio radio show, uh, answer your questions about covenant eschatology. So be sure to uh, check on that here shortly. Saturday, right? David? All right. Well, yes. All right. Good. Okay. Well, we're about to wrap up, ladies and gentlemen. We're out of time. I want to thank you for tuning in today, and um, be sure and keep uh, Jan Preston in your prayers and Dunn as they uh, work together on uh, helping her to uh, full recovery of her health. Daniel, thank you for being with us today as well. Appreciate all of your comments. And, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back on next week with another broadcast on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Until that time, this is William Bell saying, Have a very pleasant evening thank you for joining the two guys in a bible radio broadcast 
On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Over 100 years ago, Boar's Head opened its doors with a different set of rules. No cutting corners, no compromises. Exceptional Boar's Head products began to appear. Our deluxe ham, oven gold turkey, and ever roast chicken. Made to standards rarely found in the deli business today. Of course, Boar's Head isn't sold everywhere. Only in stores that share our high standards and slice our products fresh at the deli. Boar's Head. Compromise elsewhere.